Hey guys, how you doing? Glory to the Father, Son, Spirit, in mighty name. Glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. Glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. <clears throat> Yahweh Rapha, Yahweh Rapha, Yahweh Rapha, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahweh Shalom, Yahweh Shalom, Yahweh Shalom, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Be glorified, Father. Be glorified, Lord Jesus Christ. Be glorified, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Feed us the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give us the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Control my tongue and my mouth and purge my tongue and mouth to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. Watch us, Father, my God, and say, the King, Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. We got a lot to talk about. <clears throat> uh, Nathan, if I have to see your comments, I'm going to have to send you out of here. Your comments shouldn't be that important. What you should be doing is sitting and listening and praying, asking the Holy Spirit to use me as his mouthpiece to bless you. We got a lot to talk about, brethren. Hit the like button. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. That's the only way you can comment. And share this on your social media platforms. Oh, this is Spirit Mighty Name. Yeah, bro, for all this is Spirit Mighty Name. Truth, how are you, sister? Sargon, what's up, man? I haven't seen you in a while. Keep it that way. Tom Joe Gotch. All right. Anyway, guys, help me to help you. Help me by respecting the rules of the channel. Focus, listen, answer questions. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill us to overflowing, that he corrects me from making any mistakes and anoints me to speak his words clearly and to give us illumination. You don't engage each other. You don't engage me. You focus. It's a class. You're here to learn for the glory of the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. This is not a place where you can shoot a fat. We wanted to make this a serious channel for serious theology, beseeching the Holy Spirit and trusting in the Holy Spirit to come and teach using human instruments. And I pray I'm one of them for the glory of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right, That the Lord Jesus Christ will increase in us, be magnified in and through us by our words, our deeds, our actions. That we are the hands and feet and the mouthpiece of the Holy Spirit. And that he owns the channel. He owns my ministry, owns your ministries, your channels, own my blog, and own us fully and completely, and own my daughters and our loved ones for the glory of the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. So stay focused, all right? Do not be distracted. Vendoran, if I have to remember you, know I'm going to send you out of here. May the Holy Spirit of the living God perfect my sight spiritually and physically and use my eyes for purity to focus on the Word. Meditate on the word and obey the word to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and not to be tempted to sin or lust. Please, God. Glory to the Father and Spirit. We got a lot to discuss. A lot to discuss. And you can see the spiritual whores are already manifesting. The rabid dogs, the spiritual whores, Muhammad's bastards, and Satan's dogs are already manifesting. So this is why I'm here. I crush mouths, humiliate them, teach them the fear of the Lord Jesus Christ. So keep distracting, guys. Anyway, I don't know if you've heard the latest news. Is that Kennedy Hall? No, that's not Kennedy Hall. Kenneth Holmes. I thought you had Kennedy Hall's picture. I don't know if you heard the latest news, but Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has declared that Israel is in war. Benjamin Netanyahu has declared that Israel is in a state of war. So they've declared war. So they've declared war because they've been attacked. And I just saw a video where Hamas kidnapped an Israeli teenager, a young lady, a female teenager, and they're pulling her and dragging her by her hair, and they had her cuffed up. So this is now going to be a major bloodbath. So it has been announced. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu came out and he declared that Israel is in a state of war. So they've declared war. Declared war. All right. So just to let you know, things are going to get very bad. It's going to go from bad to worse. And it seems like we're gearing towards World War III. I'm not a prophet. I don't say, thus saith the Lord. I don't receive revelations. But I'm observing the times. And it looks like 
the powers that be are preparing for a huge world catastrophe, a war that will involve the nations. There'll be major destruction across the globe and millions will die. And we may be among those millions. May the Holy Spirit fill us and seal us and guard us and protect us not to be afraid. May we be men and women of the faith, lions and lionesses for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Death is inevitable until Jesus returns, but it's going to happen. I see it's happening. They're trying to push a world war to bring major destruction in order to bring about their global agenda. That's what it looks like. So be prepared, guys. This tells you why you can't take your faith lightly and you can't just have a shallow level understanding of Scripture. We need to be truly filled with the Holy Spirit. And ask the Holy Spirit to give us the greatest gifts, perfect faith in our God, hope in our God, and love for our God, and cling to our God, Father, Son, Lord Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit, and obey Him. Because death is inevitable until the Lord returns. Therefore, if you are one of those fake Christians who pay lip service, well, this will be a sifting, where our Lord Jesus will sift the wheat from the chaff, the men from the boys, the women from the girls. And I pray that all of us men are men of the Lord Jesus Christ, warriors, we practice what we preach, and our sisters are lionesses for the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Sonia, how are you doing, sister? Reach out to me to talk about your family member because I guess you said in the previous session, the previous session, you have a family member that became Muslim. Reach out to me. Maybe we can make an arrangement. I can talk to them if the Lord Jesus wills. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. So let's get ready. By the grace and mercy of our God, Father, Son, and Spirit. See, I told you the dogs manifest, and I'm going to insult them, and they're female dogs that birthed them. They're whore mothers. They have no shame and honor, and I'm just going to humiliate you and crush your mouths, and you little queers are going to be hiding behind a screen like little pussycats because you're not men because you wouldn't say it in front of my face, but it's okay. May the Lord Jesus Christ use me to crush your mouths and humiliate you for his glory. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. So we got a lot to discuss. Are we ready? Are we getting ready? Help me to help you. Please, let's stay focused. The dogs will manifest. Don't engage the dogs. What's up, Orthodox Zina? I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been, sister? You've been hiding from the channel. I usually send out notifications. I have people on my phone list and on my Skype. When I have time, I will send you a notification, a link that I'm going live because I know that some of you don't get notified by YouTube because I think I'm shadow banned. In point of fact, that should tell you how bad the censorship is, I got an email from YouTube yesterday that one of my videos was banned by Pakistan. The Pakistani government sent a notification to YouTube. They don't want my video to be shown in Pakistan so those who access YouTube can't access it in Pakistan. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Holy Spirit. Hold on. Let me do this. We'll pray thoroughly and we begin. I got a lot to cover here. I'll show you the email. Here's the email. I got it yesterday. So I contested it. This was sent to me yesterday, all right? Here it goes. Here we go. Watch here. Watch here. Censorship all over the world. Look here, look here, Sargandi. Look at this. Hi, Shimunian. We have received a legal complaint from a government entity regarding your content. After review, the following content has been blocked from view on the YouTube country site listed below. What video? Muhammad's false prophecy and best evidence for Christ's deity. The content has been blocked from view on the following YouTube country site, Pakistan. Can you believe that? <laughs> glory to the Father, glory to the Son, Lord Jesus Christ, glory to the Holy Spirit. Father, rebuke distractions. Lord Jesus Christ, rebuke distractions. Holy Spirit, rebuke distractions. Constrain us, control us. Be our self-control, self-restraint, self-constraint, and purge us in the purifying fire of the Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Holy Spirit. Purge us, save us from our own flesh and weakness. Save us that we never shame the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Lord Jesus Christ, or blaspheme or betray the Lord Jesus Christ. Crush our mouths and our flesh to walk in holiness and purity and righteousness and obedience. Perfect our love for you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, our hope in you and faith in you. 
Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the one true God, the Father, the Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, feed us the flesh of Jesus Christ. Give us the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do that. Please, Father, please, Lord Jesus Christ, please, Holy Spirit, for my daughters, bring them to me and our loved ones in Jesus' name. Lord, Father, wash me, Lord, anything, Lord Jesus Christ. Busy with life as you're in it. I did catch us. Okay, that's good, Orthodox. And I saw that you were there. Hopefully, the Lord is preserving you. May He preserve all of us and provide your daily bread. And that we practice what we preach and help each other by our deeds. And I pray I do that and I do more of it. May the Lord Jesus destroy our fear of finances and lust for more. <clears throat> May He purge us and our motives not to do it for fame, status, fortune, position, numbers. May we never prostitute ourselves for fame. For money, for numbers, may the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit fill us to overflowing. May the Father of Lord Jesus Christ fill our loved ones, my daughters. May the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ fill us with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And as I pray, I immediately include my daughters, my angels, and your loved ones, all our loved ones, for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Father feed all of us the holy flesh of Jesus Christ. Grant us all the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to heal us. And make us whole and perfect us and sanctify us and purify and purge us spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and physically. Nourish us and sustain us, giving us the power of the Holy Spirit to have such faith to move mountains that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Father will constrain us, deliver us from our flesh, the fruits of the flesh, destroying the lust of our eyes, the lust of our flesh, destroying our pride, our arrogance, our ego. Destroying fake piety, fake humility, fake humbleness, and fake spirituality, religiosity. May the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ make us doers of his word. Bold lions and lionesses practicing what we preach. Destroying the beams from our eyes. Hypocrisy from us. May the Father fill us with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Flood us in the fountain of living waters. The Holy Spirit of the living God. The Spirit of the Father and the Son of the Lord Jesus Christ. And flood my daughters. Flood our loved ones with the Holy Spirit and seal us by the Holy Spirit. Control us by the Holy Spirit. May the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ control our tongues and our mouths. Seal our tongues and our mouths by his infinite power to never utter any wicked, filthy, blasphemous, idolatrous statement against our God. The Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, that he'll control our mouths to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ with our dying breath. May the Father strengthen us to undergo all things. The same Holy Spirit that filled the holy prophets, the holy apostles, and the early church. We ask the Father to fill us with that glorious, beautiful Holy Spirit. And give us the power to be perfectly disciplined spiritually and physically. To teach us how to pray more, how to fast more, how to study the word, recite, recall, obey, live out the word. Glorify the Lord Jesus Christ by proclaiming the word. And to love one another by our deeds, to be men and women of action. And I pray the Father will help me to practice what I preach. That I will be a doer of his word. Less lip service and more action. Because the Lord Jesus said, if we love him, we'll keep his word. Empower us, Father, to show that we love the Lord Jesus Christ, not for the praise of men. The hell with what people think of us. And may the Father empower us to crush the mouths of dogs and blasphemers and insult and humiliate these filthy dogs spiritual horse from the pit of hell until they repent and fear the Lord Jesus Christ or until they're removed and may the father use us to strengthen one another to love our brothers sisters Lord Jesus Christ who are weak and timid and be patient with them as the father is patient with us and to build them up to bear one another bear one another's burdens by the power of the Holy Spirit and I ask father that you give me the grace to do that and not to be impatient save me from my own wounds impatience anger <clears throat> slothfulness, laziness, purge us from these things, Lord. Set me free from food addiction or lust. And I, I ask, Father, that you help all of us with the sins we struggle in common and those that are unique to each one of us. You know our sins. We trust in you, in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Holy Spirit. Purify, pure, purge, transform us, Father, for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And strengthen my tongue. Loosen my tongue to speak clearly and accurately. Save me from lisp from stammering and stuttering. Save me from error. Correct any mistakes I make to hate error and sin. All of us, Father, to hate and error and sin and make my voice pleasing to the ears of your children, Father, and strengthen my throat with the health I need from the Lord and giver of life, the breath of life, the Holy Spirit of the Father, your spirit, your son's spirit, the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen my heart, my arteries, my lungs, my chest, 
and give me the health I need, the discipline to stay healthy and fit and use my help not for pride or arrogance or vanity. Remove that from me, but to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, serve his church with the health you've given me, to use my health to see my daughters grow up. Please, Father, take over this session. Perfect the gifts you've given me for ministry. Perfect recall of every jot, tittle portion of scripture. Perfect exegesis and empower us by the Holy Spirit to plunge the depths of scripture. Feast on the meat of scripture. Live out and obey and love scripture because that is your glorious voice. The voice of your son, Lord Jesus Christ. The voice of your glorious, beautiful Holy Spirit speaking to us in scripture. May the voice of our God, your voice in scripture, drown out all other voices in our lives. Eliza, my daughters. And our loved ones to be enslaved to your voice in scripture in love with your voice in scripture transformed and made alive by your voice in scripture to be doers of the word take over father take over lord jesus take over holy spirit my ministry is yours youtube channel is yours my blogs are yours articles are yours all we have we give to you my bank accounts yours father yours lord jesus yours holy spirit and i pray that you give us power to mean it and walk the walk and I pray that we all come in agreement, own all we have and not to be afraid, to trust in you and not to cling to this world, to crucify the world from us, crucify our flesh, to overcome the world and hate the things of the world and hate Satan and crush him under our feet by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and save us from our own flesh. Save us men from Jezebels and save my sisters from wolves. So we glorify you, Father. Glorify you, Lord Jesus Christ. Glorify you, Holy Spirit. And I pray I'm a blessing to my neighbors, that I'm not a distraction to them. May I shine with the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ and be the light of the Lord Jesus to them. They'll see Christ in all of us. See Christ in me. Bless the internet connection, the honor of visual qualities, and take over. And let your Holy Spirit be the teacher and destroy distractions. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Lord, watch us. Lord, my God, say, Lord Jesus Christ. And help me be content with the numbers that you bring for your glory. Okay, brother, we got a lot to discuss. I also decided to discuss a session I watched yesterday, and I got to finish it today. What happened, Say Cheese? Something happened? My cousin say something? Hold on. What happened, Say Cheese? Oh, man. Oh, my goodness. All right. I didn't know that. That's my cousin. I didn't even know that. Yeah, uh, you guys may not know this, but say cheese, we're actually really cousins. and We're not lying. We are actually cousins. No lie. No joke. We're cousins. We're related. His dad and my dad were related. They were cousins. So this guy's actually my cousin. So if you can, lift up Agnes to the Lord Jesus Christ, that she'll come out of this surgery, brain aneurysm, by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit of life, that she'll be completely restored and healthy because brain aneurysm, it's not a joke. People die from brain aneurysm. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, they caught it and the surgery was successful. For the Lord Jesus Christ and drink the water of the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Holy Spirit. Okay, Mommy, I'm live right now, but don't forget, pray every day, right? What's the miracle you're going to pray for? Lord Jesus Christ, bring us together today, not tomorrow, sooner than later, so I can raise you up. And Lord Jesus, keep us healthy and in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and provide for me so I can provide for you. Soon we'll see each other. I love you, girls. Okay, that was my, my first born. Well, Bruce Lee died of a cerebral edema, slightly different from a brain aneurysm. But anyway, let's focus. Okay, what I did yesterday was I found a discussion by Seventh-day Adventist pastor Doug Batchelor, Douglas Batchelor, Doug Batchelor, Douglas Batchelor. May the Holy Spirit save me from lisp, from stammering confusion, and guard my tongue from error. Take over, Holy Spirit. You're the teacher. Teach us and perfect us to glorify the Father to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and love the Lord Jesus Christ and love and cling to you, Holy Spirit. All right. Okay, we're going to... Hey, uh, buddy, I'm live right now. Can you come to my live stream and watch? I'm live right now. Hey, Skimuni, I know you're upset that the Shia raped your mother in the name of Allah and his dog, Muhammad, and they molested her, calling it Muta, and gave birth to a bastard like you. But 
Go back to your vomit like the little whore that you are. Because you're not going to last here, you spiritual bastard. I would spit on you, but my spit and urine is cleaner than you and the dog that birthed you. <laughs> Sucks being you. I live in your head. I own you, punk. <laughs> All right. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Holy Spirit. You ready? You know that I own these guys. When they manifest like the little spiritual hordes they are, they don't understand. They're actually confirming I live in their heads. I own them, and I make their life miserable like the Shia made their mothers miserable when they hoard their mothers in the name of Allah and his dog Muhammad. And they can't do a damn thing about it. Thank you. I own you. Glory, Lord Jesus Christ. Like Jesus owns Muhammad and he buried him in hell. I own you. I live in your head, punk. Live with it. <laughs> you little spiritual bastard. <laughs> All right. You guys ready? Everyone ready? You're ready? Glory to the Father and the Spirit. Help me to help you. Let's stay focused. Mods, you know what to do. With the demonic bastards born of female dogs. We're going to focus. Sadly, or maybe fortunately, I got to watch Pastor Douglas Batchelor. He's perhaps the most well known Seventh day Adventist minister. The reason why I watched it, no, we can't talk later. All types of waves, stay away from me before I get my cat to urinate on you. Get the lot of here. All right. Now, the reason why I watched it is because he did a session on the Archangel Michael. I already know what seven-day Adventists believe about the Archangel Michael. So I decided to watch it. We're going to play some clips, and we're going to discuss it. So that's why I expanded the title. Jesus is Michael, and then we're going to go and deal with Shake Ketchup Boy, Fib and Farouk, Shake Porky Pig. May the Lord Jesus Christ use me to crush his mouth as the Lord Jesus has crushed his prophet in hell and save Muslims from Muhammad and protect non-Muslims from Islam and strengthen the church of the Lord Jesus Christ for your glory, Father, for your glory, Lord Jesus, for your glory, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. So let's focus. Do not distract. I'm going to get you out of here. So I already know what seven-day Adventists believe about the Archangel Michael. So I decided to watch it. And therefore, he made some statements, which we will play. There are clips we will play because this will be a teaching moment. We want the Holy Spirit to teach. It's his class, and I'm his mouthpiece for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may I not be deceived. I pray the Spirit will show me I belong to him, that we belong to him, and save us from our own sin and error. But before I play the clips, I'm going to have to share some important facts. So listen, brethren. Listen. Do not distract. I read your comments to get feedback to make sure you're learning. If I see comments, not relevant topic, I get discombobulated. You become a stumbling block, and I got to get you out of here. Respect the rules and respect our Lord Jesus Christ. Let the Spirit work in and through me. Douglas Batchelor is a Jewish believer in the Trinity. Ethnically, he's Jewish, but he became a seven-day Adventist. He's perhaps the most popular Seventh-day Adventist minister. Not the most knowledgeable, but he's the most popular because he's the one who does what's called Amazing Facts. And that is broadcast all over social media. It's on satellite Christian stations. It's on YouTube. You'll find Amazing Facts. So being ethnically Jewish, who now believes in the Trinity, and embracing seven-day Adventism and believing that Ellen G. White was a vessel used by the Lord Jesus Christ, Bachelor is a very intriguing and interesting case study. A Jewish person who ends up believing Jesus is the Messiah, who ends up claiming to believe in the Trinity, who ends up believing that Jesus is God in the flesh, who believes in the virginal conception birth of Jesus, his physical death, resurrection, and physical bodily return. Ends up becoming seven-day Adventist who believes in Ellen G. White being used of God to announce inspired revelations and interpretation of specific books of the Bible, 
that have to do with the return of Christ. Prophecies in Daniel and Revelation. But as a seven-day Adventist, he also thinks that the Pope is the Antichrist. And he thinks that Sunday worship is the mark of the beast. But he doesn't come out and say it with that passion. And he doesn't come out and say it that explicitly. I don't know if you know this. I have brought a brother on, and he's probably listening right now. I made him a mod, who runs the YouTube channel Answering Adventism. Answering Adventism. His father is a seven-day Adventist. The Lord Jesus Christ snatched them out of Adventism, and the Lord has put a burden in his heart to expose the teachings of Ellen G. White and Seventh-day Adventism. Go watch the interviews he did with me on my channel, and then go to his YouTube channel, Answering Adventism. Now, the brother is still on a journey, and he's listening right now. Ask the Lord Jesus to guide him to the fullness of the truth, because he left one cult. Currently, he's reformed Calvinist, but he's not staunchly anti-Catholic, but ask the Lord Jesus to soften him and guide him and sanctify him and do that for all of us to come to the fullness of the truth. Now, he has brought Anthony Rogers on and interviewed him, and he knows I don't like that slob because now I believe that Anthony Rogers is a tool of the devil and he's a false Christian. May the Lord Jesus rebuke and chasten him and teach him to fear the Lord until he repents. And may the Lord Jesus save me from my own hypocrisy and not become the thing I hate. But be that as it may, I do not throw out the baby with the bathwater. He still has a lot of good stuff exposing Adventism. And boy, do you see the Adventist manifesting in my comment section because of his videos and because of that clip where I explained what the true Sabbath happens to be. Now, go and learn about Adventism from him. He quotes their official sources. He brings other experts, and he tells you what they actually teach in their official sources, what Ellen G. White actually taught, Ellen G. White. Now, you know what's ironic about Ellen G. White? Her husband's name was James, right? Now, answering Adventism, maybe you can correct me. Fact check me on Google. I was told that her husband, his name was James White. Her, her husband's name was James White. Are you, are you get it? James White. Where have I heard that name before? Oh, we have a James White today who's a Calvinist, Reformed Baptist, a Bible butcher, and a butcher of church history. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was also told she was related to Joseph Smith. She's related to Joseph Smith. Did you know that? Glory to God for Dante's testimony. I don't know if you saw it. Praise the triumph God. Glory to the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit for you. May the Holy Spirit bring all of us to the fullness of the truth. And we die in union with the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. We praise God for you, Dante. May you become stronger and stronger. So Ellen G. White was also related to Joseph Smith. Right? There's a connection there. Right? So, isn't it ironic? The 19th century, 1800s, was a spawn for cults, cultists, and cult leaders. Right? Now, here's the thing. Are you aware that Charles Taze Russell, who started what eventually became the Joe's Witnesses, was influenced by the Adventists? Now, here's where I'm preparing you. Because what you're about to hear from Doug Batchelor is what you would hear from Greg Stafford and any Jehovah Witness. Pay attention to me, brethren. This is a fact. Charles Taze Russell came under the teachings of Adventists, the Millerites. This is why you will find that Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists are very similar in their views. In fact, historically, initially, the first Adventists were not Trinitarians. This is why there's a movement among Adventists. They're splitting, and it's huge. There's a movement among Adventists that are calling 
the so-called Trinitarian Adventists back to their historic roots. And they quote the original Adventists showing that they did not believe in the Trinity. Do you know that? Do you know that? May the Holy Spirit correct me on the spot, save me from error, and perfect my recall of all the facts in every jot, tittle portion of Scripture. They were not Trinitarians. They were Arians in that they did not think that Christ was uncreated as the Father. This is why there is so much similarity between Joel's Witnesses and Adventists. One similarity, guys, pay attention. I'll give you more than one. They both believe when you die, you cease to be conscious. Joe's Witnesses and Adventists, whether the Arian branch of Adventism or the so-called Trinitarian branch represented by Doug ba Batchelor, they both teach that when you die, you cease to be conscious. What the Adventists would call soul sleep. That's one. They both deny eternal conscious torment. They do not believe that God punishes people forever in hell. So they're both annihilationists, conditionalists. And a third thing that unites them. Are you ready for this? Because this is what we're going to play. Okay. Are you ready for this? This is what we're going to be playing from Doug Batchelor. You're going to be astonished. If you didn't know that Doug Batchelor believed that Jesus is uncreated, and God, that's what he's going to say, that he claims to believe in the Trinity, you would think he's a Jehovah Witness because I'm not lying to you. Just recently, Greg Stafford did a series of talks on why he believes Jesus is the Archangel Michael. And I'm not lying to you, brethren. Please listen. Let the Holy Spirit teach. Learn. Doug Batchelor used the very same texts, very same verses, very same verses. You know, brother, I'm going to block you, right? You know I'm going to block you, right? I'm sorry? You know I'm going to block you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I just told you I'm live. Come to my channel. Why are you calling me disrupt, disrupting my stream? I, I, thought, I thought you said to call No, me. I didn't tell you to call me. I said I'm live. Hang up before I block you, brother. You got five seconds. Five, oh. four, three, okay. two. Sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. Satan wants his rack. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Almighty, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit of the Father and Son, rebuke all distractions, save me from error, constrain us, and guide us. Father, Son, Spirit, watch us, Lord, my God, save me from Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch here. Uh, yes, if you're a moron and a filthy dog, and a bastard, son of a dog, I will debate you if you're a moron. Contact me on Skype so I can first test to see if you're a moron because he just said he's a moron, guys. Thomas said, hey, will you debate me? I'm a moron. Well, if you're a moron and a bastard and a son of a female dog, I'll be more than happy to bury you and your fake God and your fake prophet because you are of the pit of hell, a dog, and I want to stuff you with your vomit. Hopefully you repent and become a true Christian. Glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Skype me, moron, so I can expose you for the moron that you are. So he just said, hey, Sam, I'm a mor moron. Well, we know you're a moron. You're a special kind of stupid. A bastard of the devil. May the Lord Jesus save you. So Skype me, and I'll have fun at your expense. Now, for the rest of you, listen. Pay attention to this. The arguments that Douglas Batchelor uses, and I'm going to give you the link. The argument that Douglas Batchelor uses are identical to the arguments that Greg Stafford used. Greg Stafford did a series over the past year why he mm -hmm. thinks Jesus is Archangel Michael. I swear to you, if you listen to Greg Stafford and Doug, Douglas Batchelor, the same texts, the same verses, but here's what's astonishing. Are you guys ready? Here's what's astonishing. They use the same texts the same verses to prove that Jesus is Michael, but they arrive at a different conclusion. Greg Stafford thinks Michael is created. Douglas Batchelor thinks Michael is uncreated because Michael is a name for Jesus. 
and Jesus is God and he's not created. You see the irony here. Let me repeat. Two different groups, two different individuals representing two different groups, both using the same passages to arrive at the same conclusion. Jesus in his pre human existence, the Archangel Michael, but both groups arguing for something different. Joe's Witness saying, see, that proves that Jesus is the first creature. Douglas Batchelor, you're, you're, you're going to hear him because I'm about to play him, right? Douglas Batchelor says, see, that's proof that Michael is not created. Proof that Michael is uncreated. What's the proof? The proof is Jesus is uncreated. Jesus is God, has no beginning. And since one of his titles is Michael, that means Michael is not a creature. You got it? Do you understand the irony here? I'm going to play Douglas Bachelor. I'm going to play him. I'll show you the video. I don't want to give you the link because you don't need to go and view it and add to his views. You don't want to do that. Do you understand now? Now, you're going to be shocked at something else. Let me shock you a little more. Okay, you guys get ready for this shock. And he's right. And I'm going to be reading citations. Okay, watch here, guys. Please focus. A uh, Yeet fanatic. Bring the Shia so I can debate them why they molested your mother and did muta with that whore giving birth to a bastard like you. Okay, stop barking like your mother. Face of garbage. All right. I'm going to shock you with another important fact. Here is James R. White's book, The Forgotten Trinity, the first edition and the second edition, okay? I got both editions. This is the first edition. This is the second edition. You guys ready for this shock? And I'm going to quote James White admitting this. I'm going to quote some of the reformers admitting this because Douglas Batchelor will mention it and cite some of them. You guys ready? Focus. It's okay, brethren. Lord Jesus, increase the numbers for your. Are you guys ready? One is updated. This is an updated edition, but it's basically the same. Lord Jesus, bless the inner connection. In Jesus' name, rebuke Satan, Father. Rebuke Satan, Lord Jesus. Rebuke Satan, Holy Spirit, and constrain his dogs. Okay. This is slightly updated, but it's the same content. Okay. Are you guys ready now? Are you aware that the reformers... John Calvin, John Gill, Jonathan Edwards, and that even Bible expositors like Matthew Henry also taught that Michael was a name for the Lord Jesus Christ. They taught that Christ is Michael and Michael is one of the names of Jesus Christ. The reformers taught that John Calvin in his commentary in Daniel 12, which I have, and I'm going to give you the link and I'm going to read. John Gill, who is a Reformed Baptist who wrote a massive commentary in the Bible. Gill's commentary in the whole Bible. He believed that. Matthew Henry mentions that. Jonathan Edwards. They all taught that Michael was a name for the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that? Are you got, I'm not lying to you. Even James White mentions there were reformers, Trinitarians, that believe Michael was simply a name for the Lord Jesus Christ, but conveniently doesn't tell you who those individuals were. Okay? I'm going to read from the horse's mouth, and I'm going to give you the link from Calvin and read what Calvin says. I'm going to do a post about it, but I'm going to let Doug Batchelor share that information with you. Royal, if you're an Oriental Orthodox, I'm going to be Occidental Orthodox. I'll be the opposite of you. If the Oriental Orthodox allows someone like you in their church, that's proof I need to go to another church. So keep barking and I'm going to muzzle you. So now, watch. Let me now play the clip. Okay, let me now play the clip. I'm going to show it to you on my phone, but I don't want to give you the link. Here's what we're going to play from. Okay. Watch here. Okay, one second. One second, guys. Watch here. 
Let's go and let's play. I got a lot to discuss. Sit in the saddle, enjoy, and pray for my health to stay healthy and holy to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is. I'm going to just show it to you. This is the video right here. But I'm going to play it on my computer at specific points. All right. This is it right here. You see? This is it. This is the video right there. So I'm going to play it on my computer here. Let's begin, and we're going to discuss. It's okay, truth. When they manifest, that means glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're doing something good. So mods, get on it and block and muzzle these dogs and their mothers. So let's begin. Let me get there. Let me give you the time steps. We're not going to play all of it, obviously. And fair use. Copyright. Fair use. Okay? So I don't get flagged. All right? It's called fair use, YouTube, for educational purposes. Can't flag me. God forbid, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, may the Lord protect this channel. He doesn't need me. I need him. All right. We're going to start at, let's do this. Okay, one second. Let's remove this. I'm going to play and you're going to hear. We're going to start at the 11 minute, 13 second mark. Listen, listen. To the irony. Now, I'm going to teach you something. As Christians who are called to evangelize and do apologetics, we need to be master spiritual chess players. Think 50 moves ahead of your opponent to distort their blasphemies and their lies and take them captive for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to teach you how to use this argument against Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay? But be patient, focus, do not be distracted. So let's play the clip. You ready? 11 minute, 13 second mark. Let me know if you can hear. Let's hear. Let's begin. 11 minute, 13 second mark. We'll start a little earlier. No Persian kingdom. As loud as it gets. Now it says, Michael, one of the chief princes. That word one throws people. Doesn't mean God's got many chief princes. The word one, echad, in Hebrew, echad. And it means. Can you hear him? Uh, it can mean one. This is as loud as it gets. Can you hear the guy? Let me know if you can hear him. Yazin, the Shia can hear your mother screaming after they do muta with her. Okay, so get the ladder. Go lick the black stone. Maybe by licking the black stone, it'll open up your ears. Okay, listen now. You pay attention. Numerically, first or greatest one. It's like you would call the president's wife the first lady. It doesn't mean she's the only lady. It means that there's a, a position of honor. And so it's really saying, Michael, first of the chief princes or greatest of the chief princes. Let me explain what he's saying here. In Daniel 10, 13, Daniel 10, 13, there you'll read, if you read your English translation, it says, Michael, one of the chief princes. One of the chief princes. He's explaining where you find the proof that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Archangel Michael. So in Daniel 10, 13, if you read your Bible, it says, Michael, one of the chief princes. He's trying to convince people that the word one, echad, can mean first or greatest because your mother upsets me, Matt. Why did that whore... Sleep around with the Shia like a prostitute and give birth to you, Matt. Because you're a filthy dog, you're scum, you need to be muzzled and cage, you animal. Glory to the Father, the Son, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. So, Daniel 10, 13. May the Lord strengthen my throat, make my voice pleasing to your ears. If you read your Bible, it says, Michael, one of the chief princes. But he says the word echad can mean first of the chief princes or the greatest. In other words, he realizes if you render Daniel 10, 13 as one of the chief princes, then he's only one among many. But the Lord Jesus Christ is not one among many. The Lord Jesus Christ is King of kings, Lord of lords. So they propose an alternate translation. Are you guys ready? You're learning. Class has begun. Learn with me, brethren. Let the Holy Spirit use me to sanctify us. You get it now? You understand? Right? You understand what he's trying to get at? You understand what he's trying to get at? If you go with the translation, one of the chief princes, right? 
one of the chief princes, then he's one among many. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's not one among many. So they propose a different translation. That the word one, achad, can mean the first of the chief princes. That he's the head. He's the first or the greatest. Well, if you translate it that way, then there's no problem in viewing Michael as the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, let me know if you got this point. I can't move on. This is for you to learn by the power of the Holy Spirit. Glory to the Father, Son, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. Take over, Holy Spirit, and illuminate us to understand. Joel, it doesn't matter what he knows, dude. You want me to call him so you can have a conversation with him? You focus so I can let him continue speaking. Okay, everyone got it? So I can move on to the next point. Come on, guys. Move along. Speed up your responses so I can move on. So now, if you translate it, the first of the chief princes or the greatest, no problem with viewing this as the Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch what else he's going to go on to say. So that's one clue. One clue. It's not totally clear. Go to Daniel 10, 21. 10, 21. Chapter. But I'll tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. Thanks. So Michael is your prince, Daniel. He's your ruler, Daniel. Your ruler, Israel. Listen. To Daniel. This is Gabriel talking to Daniel. He says, Michael, your prince. Who is the prince? Who's the prince? Oh, get your credit card out. Get your There's credit card. Listen to this. Turn with me now to a prophecy about the Messiah. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. This is one of the most important prophecies in all of the Bible. It pinpoints. Now watch what he's going to do. He's your prince, Daniel, the word prince. That's Daniel 10, 21. Then he's going to go to Daniel 9, 25, where the Messiah is called prince. Pay attention, guys. In Jesus' name, learn. This is a class. Do not distract. May the Holy Spirit illuminate us. You're going to learn a lot. Trust me, if you're just patient and don't distract. So wait, Michael's your prince, Daniel? But in Daniel 9, 25, the Messiah is called prince. <gasps> See, Messiah is Michael. The first coming of Jesus, I think you could have pinpointed basically the time when Christ would be born, as well as the time he would be baptized, at the time he would be crucified, all from Daniel 9. This is how much money YouTube has been paying oh me for goodness. a brand you new shut YouTube up? channel that only you and has 400 subscribers. May they stick it What's where even don't crazier you than your that, money. though, is that... But we'll have to go there in a few weeks during our prophecy seminar. Know therefore and understand, Daniel 25, that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. Now there you have it. Who gotcha. is the Prince? <gasps> Who is Daniel's Prince? Who is the chief Prince? <gasps> Who is he? He got you. Messiah. He got you. But some of you aren't convinced. Some of you are not convinced. Look with me in your Bibles. We okay. just read. Some of you are not convinced. Okay. You guys here to learn? Let's see the argument. Watch the argument. Daniel 10, 13, Daniel 10, 21. Michael is the first of the chief princes, the greatest of the chief princes, the greatest prince, the first prince, and he's your prince. Prince, right? Daniel 9, 25. Messiah, the prince. So if Messiah is the prince... And Michael is the greatest prince, and he's Israel's prince. But Messiah is the prince of Israel. Messiah is Michael. <gasps> well, you should be happy, Star Trek. That means now you and your gay lover can get married, and your mother and her lesbian wife can go and be public about it. So a homosexual queer like you can now be public because the Pope is blessing your homosexual unions. So be happy. Filthy piece of garbage. All right, you get it now? But what did he not tell you guys? Are you ready? Let me tell you what he did not tell you. <laughs> what he did not show you, but I'm going to show you, okay? Here, here's what he did not show you. Let me first show you the verses. What he did not show you. Uh, a lot of snack bar, a lot of snack bar, a lot of snack bar. Okay, Daniel 10, 13. 
Watch here. Let's first show you the verses, what he did not show you, what he did not explain. Daniel 10, 13. John, with the Shia, <clears throat> have your mother kiss their testicles for a million dollars? And would you <clears throat> kiss their ass sphincter for a million dollars? John, because I know your whole mother's been doing it for free. Daniel 10, 13. Now watch here. Okay, watch here, Sonia. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but what Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, so I left him there with the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now watch here, Daniel 10, 21. Okay. I notice in the Hebrew, oh, see, here we go again. See, that's what happens when you guys chime in. Stuck for a law. Okay, Daniel 10, 13. Let's continue. Now, Daniel 10, 21. I don't want to be a Hindu because I see what they did to your mother. They made her a sex guru, molesting her day and night with the Shia. All right, now. Daniel 10, 21. Daniel 10, 21. Watch here. Okay, pay attention. But I tell you what is inscribed. In the book of truth, there is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. Okay, now let's see what the word for prince is. You ready? Let's see what the word for prince is. Here it is. You can go to Bible Hub. Look at their interlinear. I'm going to put it on the screen. And you'll see it. Okay. Daniel 10, 21. Your prince, Sar Kim. Sar Kim. Pay attention. Sar Kim. The word for prince is Sar. Sar. Let me show it to you. Get ready and learn. You may not even get this in seminary, dude. So learn. Watch here. Show it to you on the screen. Sar Kim from the word Sar. Okay. Watch here. Do you see it? The word Sar Kim. Sar Kim. Okay, your prince. You see the word Sar Kim? Sar. You see it? Now let's see what the word Sar is. You ready? You guys paying attention? Let's see what the word Sar is. Watch here. Sar Kim. Okay, let's go here. Let's now see what the word for Sar Kim is. Watch here, guys. Be patient with me. Because I'm going to show you what he did not show the people or tell the people or explain to the people. What he did not show the people, tell the people, explain to the people. The word saw, right? Okay, let's see. Watch here. Okay, watch here. What's the word? Here it is. It's the word saw, right? See it on the screen? You see it's S-A-R, saw? Sar, that's the word for prince, right? Okay, now watch. Watch this, guys. Daniel 9.25. What's the word for prince there? Daniel 9.25. The word for in Daniel 10, 13, and 21 is the word sar. Okay? It's the word sar. Let's see this one. Can you guys hear me, by the way? Yeah. Okay. One second. In Jesus' name, Lord to the Father, and Spirit. But now let's see what the word for prince is in Daniel 9. Messiah the prince. Messiah the prince, right? Okay, watch here. It's okay, blood left. Just pay attention. I have a field day insulting them and their mothers. That's why I'm politically incorrect. Guess what the word for prince is? When it says Messiah the Prince. Are you ready? Let me show it to you. Okay. Let's see. It's the word Nagid. It's not even the same word. You see it? The word for Prince is not Saad. It's Nagid. Mashiach Nagid. It's a different word. Daniel 9.25, Messiah the Prince, Mashiach Nagid, Nagid. 
It's a different word. It's not sar, it's nagi. If Daniel wanted to make it clear that the Archangel Michael and Messiah are one and the same because they're both the same prince, then why use two different words? Why use sar for Michael but nagi for Mashiach if this wasn't deliberately intended by the Holy Spirit to inspire Daniel in such a way to use two different words? Okay, you with me there? You caught it? It's not the same word. But how many of those people listening would have went and fact-checked him? How many of those listening would have went and fact-checked him to see it's two different words? It's not the same. That's number one. Number two, even if it's the same word, sar, that doesn't mean they're the same person. The word sar, prince, ruler, is used for many rulers, not just one ruler. Even in Daniel 10, 13, when it says he's the first of the chief rulers, they're right there, rulers, plural. There are many rulers, many sarim, sarim. The plural for sar, ruler, is sarim. In fact, in Daniel 8, let me show you something else. Daniel 8, hey, watch this. Daniel 8. Let me show you this. Daniel 8, 25. You find the term Sar Sarim, Prince of Princes. Prince of Princes. Here, Daniel 8, 25. By his cunning, he shall make the seat prosper under his hand. And in his own mind, he shall magnify himself. Without warning, he shall destroy many. And he shall even rise up against the prince of princes. So there are many princes, many rulers. Sarim. But there is the chief ruler over all rulers. Sar Sarim. Sar Sarim. Daniel 8.25. Prince of princes. Sar Sarim, the ruler of the rulers. So just because Messiah is called ruler and Michael is called ruler, that doesn't mean they're the same ruler. Faulty logic and desperate, let alone the fact it's not even the same word. Michael is called a Sar, whereas Messiah, Mashiach, is called Nagid. Mash Mashiach Nagid, not Mashiach Sar. Now, why didn't he tell? his audience, these pertinent, important facts. Can you tell me? Everyone got it so far? Everyone got it? So now let's go on to the rest of his spiel. Let's see what the rest of his spiel happens to be. I got to play a few clips, and then we're going to get into Uthman and his attack on the Trinity. We're going to have a field day. There's going to be more, but I had to do this. I had to address this part because when I listen, I go, these clips will be teaching moments that we follow biblical advice. Proverbs 18, 17. Proverbs 18, 17. The first to present his case seems right until his neighbor comes and questions him. Proverbs 18, 17. May the Holy Spirit remind us of this passage and etch it in our souls, spirits, hearts, minds, and tongues. Proverbs 18, 17. The first... To present his case seems right until his neighbor comes and questions him. Now let's continue. You got a few more clips. Let him finish this point. A moment ago in Revelation chapter 12, this was our memory verse, talking about the supreme commander. Another way that he is introduced is the supreme commander. So I'm going to tell you what I believe the Bible teaches. When I first heard this, Listen. I thought, what? And then as I studied, and the more I studied, the more convinced I became... Oh, yeah, the evidence is pretty overwhelming. I believe that Michael is Jesus. Did you hear it? You heard it from the horse's mouth. I believe Michael is Jesus. Let me put down the air condition so the noise doesn't stir. But be careful. That doesn't mean he thinks Jesus is created. He doesn't believe 
Jesus is created. So Michael is not a creature. And I'm going to show you how you use the Adventists against the Jehovah's Witnesses. But learn by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. Focus. Lord, preserve our numbers for your glory. Watch. I believe Michael is Jesus. Now watch. Watch. In his pre-incarnation appearances. And he is not an angel. He is not a cherub or a seraphim. The word angel means a messenger. Right. His right. very name means who is as God chief of God's host or his angels. So he's saying the name Michael means who is as God, meaning he is as God. He is as God. You understand? He is as God. Michael means who is as God. Michael, meaning he is as God. <coughs> Because he's equal to God. Okay? Pay attention. We're going to have fun. I'm going to show you a strategy. Be wise as snakes, harmless as doves. Know your enemy and turn their arguments against them. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, focus. I'm going to teach you a strategy. Okay, watch. And you'll see this is a position that he holds all through the Bible. Revelation 12, verse 7, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels watch fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought well just right on the surface let me ask you who is the dragon do you normally call him the dragon or is Muhammad's that a symbolic father. name for the devil the dragon is Muhammad's father how many agree it's a symbolic name symbolic name okay, okay that's not a trick question the answer is yes so if it's saying that there is a symbolic name being used here to identify the chief of evil the devil then why would it surprise us that it uses <gasps> one of the symbolic names for Jesus? He got you there. See that? If dragon is a symbolic name for Satan, Revelation 12, then why would it shock you that in Revelation 12, 7, when it says Michael and his angels, their Michael is a symbolic name for the Lord Jesus Christ because it's the Lord Jesus Christ who owns angels and will drive out Satan and his angels. So dragon, same symbolic name. Michael, Christ symbolic name. So Michael and his angels, Revelation 12, 7, who fought with the dragon and his angels, that's the Lord Jesus Christ fighting Satan. <gasps> Got you, baby. Revelation 12, 7. Now let him finish his point. Watch her. Who is as God? Who is as God? When it talks about Michael. It says Michael and his angels. <gasps> so whoever this individual is, he has angels. Really? Whose angels are they? Look Ooh. in Matthew 16, verse 27. He got you in Matthew 16, 27. It says Christ, the son of man, will come in the glory of his father with his angels. You see, Michael owns angels. Jesus owns angels. Therefore, Jesus is Michael. <gasps> And I'll tell you why that's a fallacy and argument. But brethren, I swear to you, I'm not lying. When I was listening to Greg Stafford making his presentation, and Stafford thinks Jesus is the first creature of God, and he doesn't believe in the Trinity, making his presentation that Christ is Michael, he used the very arguments this man is using. You guys learning? Are you benefiting? Are you being blessed? Are you being blessed? No, drum. He uses Matthew 4.10 against you. So you didn't listen to the sermon. Drum. He proves that Michael, who is the angel of the Lord, is not a creature because Jesus said you are to worship God alone. But this angel receives worship, accepts worship because he's not a creature. He is God, the son, appearing as a messenger. He actually uses Matthew 4.10 against you, Drum. So listen. Do not attack arguments that they don't make or arguments that they make to refute you. Learn your enemy. Learn how they think. Learn how to then mobilize and destroy their arguments for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now you understand? Now, let me repeat. I am not exaggerating. I am not exaggerating. The very arguments he just used, Doug Batchelor, are the arguments Greg Stafford used. See, Michael and his angels. And then Stafford went to pass it. See, Christ owns the angels. And Christ is the angel Lord. And he is. He's the messenger of God, distinct from God, who appeared in visible form as fire or as a man in the Old Testament, who's not a creature, who's God Almighty, 
one with the Father and the Spirit. That we don't deny. The debate is, is that angel of God Michael? Or is that angel of God a messenger sent by the Father, but he's not Michael because Michael is a creature subject to him? That's the debate. All right? Plus, they prophet, I know you keep coming here trying to snatch some nuggets of information because you and Hideous Wood are boring as pits. Then you brought, bought, you brought in poor Rashid, may the Lord Jesus bless that man and preserve him, tortured him as he had to sit back and let David Wood speak for about 90% of the time, and you only give him like 5% of the time because you guys know you're boring as pits, so you need other people to drive up your numbers while they sit back and only get 5% of air time. So now you're here to take my arguments so you can blow up so people think that you're the greatest gift to apologetics when you are a hater and you're a thief, sir. You owe me money, sir. All right, anyway, apostate prophet, don't hate. One day invite me to your channel so I can make it go viral and correct your error, errors and tell Hideous Wood he can sit back for one session and I take over and make your channel relevant and make it go viral and avoid your errors because even Muslim metaphysician just did a video calling you out, sir. You need to repent, sir. Anyway, glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, for the rest of you, do you understand the argument of Doug Batchelor? Same argument, Greg Stafford. Same argument of Joe's Witnesses. Michael owns angels. Christ own, owns angels. All right? And who's coming with his angels to judge the living and dead? The world of righteousness, Christ. Who stands up at the last day? Who stands up in defense of God's people? Michael. And who opposes Satan's his angels? Michael and his angels. Conclusion, Christ is Michael. That's the argument. Now listen to the rest of it. Watch here. Listen. This is not a milk Bible study today. This is a meat Bible study. I counted. I've got 35 verses. So he's saying, I'm not giving you milk. This is going to be a meat Bible study. 35 verses. Wake up. Wake up. We have not yet begun to study. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father with his angels. Wow, his angels are Michael. Jesus' angels. Look at Matthew 24, verse 31. And there's others we could go to. Others we can go to. Matthew 24. He will send his angels <gasps> with a great sound of a trumpet, and they'll gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. <gasps> so it tells us that this commander is a commander of <laughs> angels. Now, we're okay. Now, that was the first clip. We got a few more. Do you understand the logic? Here's the logic. Okay, here's the logic, guys. Apostate prophet has free reign. And my YouTube channel to hate on me, to slander me, because I'm going to turn the other cheek for this guy. One day he will become a Christian who loves Jesus Christ. He's too in love with Christians and Jesus to remain atheist. So let him attack me. We'll forgive you. I'll turn the other cheek for you, sir. All right. But not from Mimi Nakab or Ali Drama. All right. Let's go through the logic here. You understand the logic? Michael and his angels fight with Satan and his angels. Christ is the one who opposes Satan. And Christ comes with his angels. Conclusion, Christ is Michael. This assumes that only Father, Son, and Spirit command angels and own angels. You with me there? This erroneously assumes that within the angelic realm, you don't have a hierarchy of authority where there are created angels who rule over other angels, where there are created angels who have angels assigned to them, a lot of angels assigned to them. So the assumption is that only the triune God, because he's, he claims to be a Trinitarian, Father, Son, and Spirit, only they own and command angels. So for Michael to own angels and command them, he has to be... One of the persons of the Godhead. Well, he can't be the Father, can't be the Spirit. He must be the Son. This is begging the question. Let me teach you how to argue, how not to argue, how to think biblically, how not to think in a manner that contradicts the Bible. Okay? This assumes that within the created angelic hierarchy, you don't have ruling angels whom God has assigned angels to each of them. So that Michael has a lot assigned to him. Angels, 
that he rules and who obey him. Gabriel doesn't have angels assigned to him. Raphael doesn't have angels assigned to him because according to Jewish tradition, which we find support in the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, Revelation 8, 2, and other passages, John mentions seven angels who are before God's throne. Well, according to Jewish tradition, there were seven <clears throat> archangels. Not one archangel, but seven. And in Revelation 8, 2, if you read 8, 2 to 5, John mentions the seven angels before God's throne. One of those seven archangels is Michael. Another is Gabriel. Another is Raphael. You with me there? So if we go with Jewish tradition and we take Revelation as confirming this tradition, seven angels before God's throne, which would be the seven chief angels, because after all, Daniel 10, 13, what did it say? Did not Daniel 10, 13 say that Michael is one of the chief rulers? One, even if you go with first, Daniel is the first, I'm sorry, Michael is the first, of the chief rulers. Well, even if you go with first, that means there are others. He's not the only one ruling. There are other ruling angels. He is the first or one of or the greatest of the chief rulers. That's what it says, Daniel 10, 13. Drum, if you keep trying to chime in and help me, I'm going to block you. I'm going to throw you the hell out of my channel. You can go to Apostate Prophet. Because you're making bad arguments. You're too stupid to see how John 1.18 does not contradict Dan Daniel 10.13. Stop helping me. Get the out of here, dude. Apostate Prophet wants you to come to his channel. And Mike Winger is waiting for you. Stop making these bad arguments. You're embarrassing me. Do not say you're on my side. Join Stafford. All right, now for the rest of you, if you're listening, Daniel 10.13 states that Michael is one of or the first of, or the greatest of, the chief rulers. The fact that the word <clears throat> rulers, plural, and the fact that these rulers are also called chiefs. Chief rulers means there's more than one ruling angel. Well, if there's more than one ruling angel, well, who are these angels ruling over, if not other angels assigned to them? You with me there? No, it's actually Mike Winger. I, I like to make fun of him. I don't hate the guy. I just like to make fun of him. Do you understand my point? Please pay attention by the power of the Holy Spirit so you learn sound theology. Here, even if we go with his translation, pay attention to the implication of this argument, why it's not sound. It does not follow. It does not follow that if Michael has angels assigned to him, and he's been assigned the role of barring Satan from heaven, he must be the Lord Jesus Christ. No. All that means is the Lord Jesus Christ authorized, empowered Michael to drive out Satan and his angels with the angels assigned to Michael and authorization he received from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all it proves. It does not follow that Michael is Jesus for what he did. Here, Daniel 10, 13. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, one of the chief rulers. Let's go with his translation. The first of the chief princes, the greatest of the chief princes. However you translate it, you still end up with, there's a group of ruling angels. A group of angels who are chiefs who rule, who are ruling angels. Now, my question would be, if there's a group of them and they are ruling, who are they ruling if not over other angels? So Michael is not the only one. Rooney, I truly believe your mother is not human. I believe she's a whore, a female dog that the Shia did muta with. So that's what I believe. Can you prove your mother is not a female dog, a whore that the Shia slept with? Skype me so then I can make an example out of you, like the Shia made an example out of your mother. So we can see if you're genuine. So there's my Skype. So did you catch it? Did you catch it? If there are a group of ruling angels, ruling spirit creatures, not one, 
There are more than one. It's a group, chief princes, ruling princes, princes that rule, who are heads, right? Chief head, head rulers. That means they must be ruling over others. Well, who are there other who are those others if not angels? You get it? So that doesn't prove Michael is Jesus. But anyway, let's go to the second clip. 22 minute mark, 10 second mark. He's going to clearly affirm Jesus is not a creature. Jesus is not a creature. So though he's Michael, Michael is not created. 22 minute, 10 second mark. Here you go. Let's go there. Right here, listen. So don't get confused. He doesn't think Jesus is created. Here. People said, for you are like an angel of God. You're like, he was a prophet, a messenger of God. And so don't be thrown by that when you hear that. We are not saying that Jesus, being Michael the archangel, is a cherub or a seraphim. He is almighty God. He is uncreated. He's the creator of all things. One more time. But prior to his One more incarnation time. as a man. Listen. On two occasions, King David, the people said, for you are like an angel of God. You're like him. He was a prophet, a messenger of God. And so don't be thrown by that when you hear that. We are not saying that Jesus, being Michael the archangel, is a cherub or a seraphim. He is almighty God. He is uncreated. He is a creator of all things. But prior to his incarnation as a man, he appeared many times in the Old Testament Sometimes it uses these phrases in the New Testament referring back to it. They're called Christophanes. When God appeared to men. When Do you hear that? So you understand their position so you don't misrepresent it. Do you understand what he said? Jesus is God Almighty. Almighty God. Almighty God. God Almighty. He's the creator of all things. He is uncreated. We are not saying that Jesus is created because he's Michael. No, Michael is one of his names. Jesus is God Almighty. God Almighty. He is uncreated, the creator of all things. So do you understand that? Do you everyone got it? Do you understand what they believe? Michael is not a creature. It's the name of of the pre-incarnate Christ. And Christ is God Almighty, the creator of all things. And Christ is uncreated. We got that part. So accurately represent them. So we got these bastards. Let's see if they're sincere. Hold on. Because these bastards are Skyping me. One second. Let's see. Pick up, bastards. Yeah, what is it? Yeah, who are you? Talk before I block you. This year. Yeah, fortunately. What is it? Oh, who cares? What do you want? Okay, so are you a Mormon bastard like Joseph Smith so I can bring you up, so I can bury you? I will piss on more, uh, Joseph Smith and you. Shut up. You're a dog. Don't tell me what to do. You want a debate? I'll bury you like Joseph Smith was buried. Shut up, you little dog. You're a bastard. What are you going to do about it? Shut up, you little slut. What are you going to do about it? Shut up, you little monkey. Shut up, you little whore like the Shia who did muta with your mommy. There you go, you stupid bastard. <laughs> Don't you love this channel? One more time, guys. Let me do this. Don't disrespect. Joseph Smith is a disrespect to humanity. We got another dog. These dogs that want to manifest. Don't disrespect. I will piss on Joseph Smith, but my urine's better than him. One second, guys. Let me get rid of these guys. Yes, that's what I thought, you little monkey, you little bastard. Hide like your mommy did from the Shia. <laughs> Simply the best. Uh, Mitchell, bro, you want to bet? You don't know Jesus. You don't know the Bible. You don't know God. You want to bet? 
the Lord would approve? Because the prophets treated dogs like you the way I'm treating dogs like you. Glory to the Father and the Spirit. Simply the best, better than all the rest. Okay, now let's go to the other clip. These guys think I care what they think. 43 minute, 55 second mark. Watch how he butchers Daniel 12, 1. 43 minute, 55 second mark. And then you're going to be shocked. You're going to be shocked, mister. Man, where is? Watch here. 43 minute, 55 second mark. I love Mormon. The guy was a Muslim pretending to be a Mormon. Don't let me piss on my urine is cleaner, though. Right? Okay. 43 minute, 55 second mark. Simply the best. Better than all the rest. Better than apostate prophet. Fries shortens the time. Why don't you up. shut up with your fries? So you have more time. Don't let me urinate on you too. Produce. Watch here. Watch here. Watch. He's going to take Daniel 12 1, where Michael stands up in the last day, which coincides with the resurrection of the dead. And we'll tie it in with Jesus Christ saying that the hour will come where the dead are in their graves will hear the voice of the Son of God and come out. He's going to connect the two just like Greg Stafford does. Watch. He's the great deliverer. Now, this is, this is the part that I really like. You notice what else is happening in Daniel 12? Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Listen. What else does Michael do? He raises. He not only sanctifies, he resurrects. See that? Some to shame, some to everlasting life. Watch what he did. Jesus, the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves will hear my voice. Hear? The voice of the Son of Man. Wow. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 16. For the Lord himself. Who? Who is coming down from heaven? The Lord himself. Cannot be misunderstood who this is. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel. Who has the voice of the archangel? The Lord. Do you hear that? Guys, I'm not lying to you. I swear I'm not lying to you. Greg Stafford in his presentation quotes Daniel 12, verses 1 to 3. And I'm going to show you those verses. Connects them with John 5, 28, 29. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, which I had to do a series of refutations on my channel. I have a series on that and articles to show... Michael stands up at the last day, coinciding with the resurrection of the dead. And in John 5, 28, 29, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, it says, The Lord Jesus will descend with the voice of an archangel. And at his voice, the dead will come out of the graves and he'll judge them. The same three passages that Greg Stafford combined to show Michael is the Lord Jesus Christ. Same three passages he combined to show that Michael is the Lord Jesus Christ. Same script, same three passages. Jo Joe's Witnesses, Greg Stafford, who believes like the Joe's Witnesses, Jesus is a creature, and yet these Trinitarian Seventh-day Adventists, same script. Because why? Charles Taze Russell. Charles Taze Russell, who started the movement that became Joe's Witnesses was taught by the Adventists. He came under the influence of the Millerites, the Adventists. This is why their arguments are similar, if not identical, and their beliefs are similar, if not identical. Joe's Witnesses, Greg Stafford, Adventists, and then Trinitarian Adventists like Doug Batchelor, using the same arguments to come to the same conclusion, Michael is Jesus, but proving Opposite views. Trinitarian Adventist, the bachelor, proving that Michael is uncreated, the creator of all things, God Almighty, because that's Jesus, whereas Joe's Witnesses and the original Adventist, using that to prove that Christ is created. Wow. Now let him finish his point because we're going to go through the passages again. Again, misinterpretation. We'll watch here. And the dead in Christ will rise. In Jude, this is the only time you find the Now word watch Michael this distortion Arch. of Jude. In Jude verse 9, there's only one chapter, so you always say Jude watch and verse. In Jude verse 9, he says, Yet Michael the archangel, 
in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring him against a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked you. Now, now watch you this. The watch what he's going to do with this passage. Brethren, listen. He's quoting Jude, verse 9, where Satan and Michael are disputing over the ownership of Moses' body. That's all it says. Watch his explanation. Please, brother, if you're going to let the demons distract you, you're not going to learn. You see they're manifesting. Let me humiliate them. Let me insult them and the dogs that birthed them because they were not born of human women. They're female dogs. May the Lord Jesus crush their mouths and humiliate them. But you learn. Let me be politically incorrect and lose numbers and lose support. May the Lord Jesus sustain me not to prostitute myself for attention, fame, or money. But let the Holy Spirit use my mouth to build you up for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Learn. Jude 9, and I'm going to go through the verses, states that Michael disputed with Satan over the rights of Moses' body. Satan wanted to lay claim to Moses' body. Michael rebuked the name of the Lord. He's going to interpret it as Michael coming to resurrect Moses on the third day, raising him back to life, and then Satan being the accuser of the brethren, accusing him in judgment with Michael rebuking Satan because Moses was forgiven. I will give every one of you $10 million to read the verse to show me where it says Michael came and resurrected Moses to life. It's talking about the body of Moses and who has rights over it, not Michael coming to resurrect Moses back to life. Watch. The Lord said the Lord rebuke you in Zechariah. Why is Michael coming for the body? Is he a mortician? See that? He can put it on ice. You know, it's interesting in the Bible, God performs one marriage. Well, two, technically. He marries Adam and Eve. And then there's a marriage supper of the lamb. That would be the other one. Watch. And God performs one funeral. It says he buried Moses. And no man knew the place of his burial. Amen. And then he comes to resurrect Moses. How do we know that? Did you hear that? And then he comes to resurrect Moses. How do I know that? Did you get it from the text? Watch how he begs the question. If you're not listening, you're not going to learn. You're wasting my time and yours. As in Mark chapter 9 on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses appears to Jesus very much alive and talks to him. This tells about when he comes. Now, it's not in the Bible. Did you catch this? In Mark 9, 2 to 7, it says Moses was alive. Therefore... This is proof that Michael came to resurrect Moses and Moses is alive, which is why he could appear alive to Jesus on the mount. You guys caught it? You guys caught it? Okay. You see how he twisted it? Mark 9, Moses appeared alive, which means Michael must have resurrected him. Do you know why he assumes that? Now, guys, listen, I hope you're being blessed. You're getting a lot of meat because the Adventists believe in soul sleep. They believe when you die, you cease to be conscious. For Moses to appear on the mount means he must have been resurrected because if he was still dead, he could not appear. Do you see how wicked and dishonest they are? They assume when you die, your spirit doesn't leave your body, your soul doesn't leave your body, and you're still alive and conscious without your physical body, but as a soul, as a spirit with a spiritual shape. No, when you die, you cease to be conscious. The only way Moses could appear alive is if God had resurrected him physically. You see the begging of the question, the circular reasoning? He's assumed soul sleep, and therefore if Moses appeared alive, that means he could not have been dead because if he was dead, he wouldn't be consciously alive, which means God had to resurrect him so he's alive. See what he did? So for him, the fact that Moses appeared in Mark 9 alive means God raised him from the dead because when you die, you cease to be conscious, so sleep. No one continues to live after they die, until the resurrection. Therefore, Michael must have resurrected Moses, which is why Moses could appear alive. 
Talk about Bible butchers. Talk about perverting scripture. Talk about destroying scripture and misleading people with your false doctrines. No, Moses did not have to be raised physically to appear alive because the Bible does not teach soul sleep. If you let the Bible speak, and I've done sessions on these, the reason why we physically die is because our spirit, our soul leaves our body, our bodies return, but we're still alive and conscious as spirits, as souls, with a spiritual shape by which we are recognizable. That's biblical teaching. So Moses was not resurrected physically. It was Moses as a spirit, in a spirit, appearing consciously alive with Elijah. Are you with me there? Well, let him finish the point so I can then go into the other passages. Let him finish the point. Boy, if you should see the demons, these spiritual horrors manifest. They're getting upset. So then I can destroy the rest of the arguments, okay? I hope you learned a lot. You're learning how to interpret Scripture, how not to interpret Scripture, how to think bib biblically, and how not to think in a manner contrary to Scripture. And do not let people get away with assuming their conclusion and quoting verses out of context. Challenge them with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit given to you. Learn, guys. That's why I'm here, in spite of my imperfections and distractions. Learn. So he's got one more minute in this clip. Let him finish his point. But it is in Jewish uh, writings called the Assumption of Moses. It says three days after Moses died, the Lord resurrected him. We have no reason to disbelieve that. See that? It may not have been true, but we know he got risen. This part is true. We know. How do you Why know is that? the devil there to accuse when Michael the archangel comes from Moses? Because he said, first of all, he sinned. Secondly, there has been no sacrifice for sin yet. Had Jesus died for sin yet? Watch this. Had he successfully overcome the devil yet? Moses is getting an advance payment by faith Watch. on a sacrifice Jesus had not yet made. And the only one who had right to do that was Michael. Jesus. Michael, only the one who He is the resurrection. Angels can't resurrect, friends. See, angels can't resurrect. Michael could resurrect. Moses, because he's not an angelic creature. He is Jesus Christ, God Almighty, and he resurrected Moses. And how do we know? Because he appeared alive to Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration. And we know when you die, it's soul sleep. You cease to be conscious. Therefore, Moses could only appear alive if he was raised physically, resurrected by Michael, who's Jesus. And there's Jewish tradition that says that Moses was resurrected on the third day. Series of assumptions that are not proven. And I'm going to demolish those passages that he misquoted. But let him finish his point. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Yep. He's the one who comes from Moses. And he says, the Lord rebuke you. And then Moses came out of the grave with a glorified body. See, Moses came out of the grave with a glorified body. That means he just contradicts Paul. Why? He just destroyed the scriptures and their consistency. Why? Because according to 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23, Jesus is the first fruits of the dead. Jesus was the first one to be raised physically, bodily, in a glorified physical body that's now immortal. How can you have Moses being resurrected before Christ became flesh, died, and was raised physically, bodily, in light of Paul saying, Christ is the first fruits, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, 23, because if Moses was resurrected in a glorified physical body before the Lord Jesus, that means Paul is wrong, Doug Batchelor. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23 says, Jesus was the first fruits, the first one to be raised physically, bodily, in a glorified physical body as a guarantee the rest of the batch will come. Now, there is strong tradition that says later on, after he was the first fruits, listen to me, even if you don't reject it, please don't attack me. There is evidence in the apostolic churches, meaning the churches that are ancient, do believe this, that later on, after being the first fruits, he then glorified the body of his blessed mother. Whether you believe it or not, still that shows you, those of you who believe in the assumption, and I believe it as well. You can condemn me for it. That doesn't contradict Christ being the first fruits. 
because he was already the first fruits before the Blessed Mother was assumed, the Dormition. Even if you don't accept it, put it aside, focus on the point. Christ was the first to be raised in a glorified physical body. You can't have Moses before Christ being resurrected in a glorified physical body without contradiction, contradicting the New Testament. Yep, Enoch and Elijah, if they were taken, that means they were taken in such a way where their bodies would have been discarded without them having to die physically for their bodies to be discarded. That's another topic. But anyway, are you with me there? Are you paying attention? So Michael resurrected Moses on the third day in his glorified physical body, which is why Moses could appear, thereby contradicting Paul. See what they do to the Bible, these Bible butchers? Now, let me refute his arguments. Let me refute his arguments. Number one, soul sleep is not biblical. Moses could appear with Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration without having to be raised physically because the Bible does not teach that when you die, you cease to be consciously alive. The Bible teaches your soul, your spirit leaves your body. Your body returns to the dust and you continue to exist consciously. You're still alive consciously as a soul, as a spirit, with a spiritual shape by which you're recognizable without your physical body. Go watch my sessions on death and the afterlife. <clears throat> Just type in the search engine, death and the afterlife. That's all you need to do. Okay. So Moses appeared as a spirit. He wasn't raised physically. His body was still buried. Okay. Thank you. All glory to the Father. All glory to the Son, Lord Jesus Almighty. All glory to the Holy Spirit. Thank you, brother. Give the Holy Spirit all glory for anything good I do. And if you love me for the sake of the Lord, ask the Holy Spirit to seal me, fill me, preserve me, and empower me to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, to obey the Lord Jesus Christ, and walk worthy of the Lord and never shame or deny or betray him in Jesus' name. Thank you, brother, for that compliment. All glory to the Spirit. Okay. Now, with that said, what about the passages he swung along? Daniel 12, 1 to 3. John 5, 28 to 29. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. He claims that in Daniel 12, 1 to 3, Michael will stand up in the latter times, which coincides with the resurrection of the dead. And yet Jesus says at the last hour, he, the son of God, will come and by his voice resurrect the dead physically from their graves. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 states that Jesus will descend with the voice of an archangel. Okay, now let's go through them systematically. You ready? Let's go through them systematically to show none of which claim what he claimed. None of which claim what he claimed. Here it is, Daniel 12. Verses 1 to 3, the first evidence that he used. But pay attention, please. Daniel 12, verses 1 to 3. The first evidence he used. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people. This is the latter days. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time... Your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Now, pay attention what it did not say. Pay attention. This is where you have to ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand what you read and meditate. And do not read on a surface level. Go deep by the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice what it did not say. Though Michael will stand up in defense of Israel, did it say anywhere he will resurrect the dead? Because now let's read 2 to 3, verses 2 to 3. Did it say anywhere that when he stands up to defend Israel, that when he stands up, he will then resurrect the dead? Or is this a period of time that will culminate in the resurrection of the dead? Watch here, Daniel 12, 2 to 3. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Where did it say Michael awakens them? Show me that, please. Where does it say 
Michael awakens them. And those who are wise shall lie, shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Now, can you show me where it says, Michael awakens the dead from the dust, raises them physically? Or does it say that during that period, this will happen? Michael will stand up to defend Israel, and as he delivers them, then this will then coincide after they're delivered with the resurrection of the dead. Where does it say Michael does it? Like Stafford, he reads too much into the passage. Now look at John 5, 28 to 29. Watch here. John 5, 28 to 29. And Jude 9 is actually their burial. Jude 9 destroys them, but I'll show you in a minute. John 5, 28 to 29. Now here our Lord does say, our Lord does say, he will raise the dead by his voice. This is Jesus speaking, our Lord speaking. John 5, 28, 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Okay. So Jesus will raise them from their graves physically at the last hour by his voice. But where did Daniel 12 say, those in the dust will be awakened by Michael. Here it is. And many of those who sleep in dust of there shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Where does it say Michael does it? Just because Michael arises to fight for the nation Israel, where does it say that after he fights for Israel, he will awaken the dead from the dust? Why are they reading too much into these passages? And then we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians 4, what he does not show you. And then we're going to use Jude to bury this argument. All right. Now, did you catch it? It didn't say Michael's going to awaken them. We have Jesus saying he'll awaken them and raise them. But it didn't say Michael will awaken them. Everyone got it before I move on? Because now I'm going to go to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. And what he failed to mention and did not quote, similar to Greg Stafford, not attacking Stafford, but I'm just saying, here's what he quoted. Because this will coincide with the resurrection. So let me read 1 Thessalonians 4.16, and then I'll give you the context. There you go. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. <clears throat> For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. You see it? The voice of the archangel. The call of the archangel. See, the Lord comes down, and when he commands the dead to rise, that will be the voice of an archangel because he is the archangel, and it's his call, his voice, his command. See? Jesus is the archangel who comes down, and by his command, by his call, his voice being the call and voice of an archangel, the dead in him will rise. Really? Are you sure? Because here's what they don't tell you. You ready? Let me read the rest of it so you can get the context. 17, 18. Here's what they don't tell you. Watch here. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, 18. Yeah, I do. I believe that too, Emiro. It's a period of time. Elapsing with the resurrection. Then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, here's what they don't tell you. When Jesus descends and comes down, he's not alone. All the angels come with him. Now, why is that important? Let me show you why that's important. And then we're going to go to Jude 9 for his burial. Jude 9 will then destroy him. All right? Watch here. I hope you're enjoying this, guys, honestly. 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 to 10. Okay, now get ready. When the Lord comes down to raise the dead, will he be alone? 1 Thessalonians 3, 11 and 13. The word saints also means holy ones. 
First Thessalonians 3, 11 and 13. Now may our God and Father himself, First Thessalonians 3, 11 and 13, and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all men, as we do to you, so that he, the Lord Jesus, because he's almighty, may he empower and preserve all of us, establish your hearts unblameable and holiest before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints, all his holy ones. That includes the angels. So is the Lord coming down alone or with all his holy ones? And who are these holy ones? Well, we know they include angels. Why? Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Verses 7 to 10. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 to 10. Here you go. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 to 10. When the Lord comes down, does he come down alone or all his angels? And to grant rest, Second Thessalonians 1, 7 to 10. With us, to you who are afflicted, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Wait, he's coming with his angels? Jesus will descend with the angels and manifest in flaming fire, a fire that will use to consume his enemies? So he's not coming down alone? Inflicting vengeance upon those who do not know God and upon right those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They shall suffer the punishment of eternal destruction and exclusion from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints. He'll glorify us and we'll glorify him and to be marveled at in all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. So did you catch it? The Lord Jesus will come down with his angels. In fact, the passage he quoted, Matthew 24, 31, establishes that. So let's look at that. So I'll explain to you what it means. Matthew 24, 29 to 31, which he quoted. Matthew 24, 29 to 31. Watch here. And it even uses the word trumpet. And he takes it to refer to the second coming. Matthew 24, 29 to 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will fall from heaven. Now, he takes it to mean second coming when he returns physically to the earth. So we'll go at his interpretation. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken, right? Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now watch. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. Oh, wait, the Lord descends with a trumpet call, the voice of an archangel with a cry of a command from one end of heaven to the other. Did you guys catch it? If you simply let the scriptures explain themselves, when the Lord Jesus descends, he comes with all his angels, all his mighty angels, which would include Michael. So that when the trumpet blows and the archangel cries aloud, that's not Jesus. That's one of the archangels announcing the Lord has come and has descended. That's all these passages mean. That when the Lord Jesus descends, the angels come with him. The angels will blow the trumpet and one of the archangels will cry aloud, Behold your king. Behold your Lord, because it was common that when a king would appear, he would have an entourage and his subjects would blow the trumpets and shout aloud, behold your king. How does this prove that Jesus is the archangel? When we're told he'll be accompanied by his angels, his powerful angels, and they will herald, 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 and announce, "Behold, your king! Your king has come." That's what kings would do. They would be accompanied with an entourage, and that entourage would blow the trumpets to announce to the city, "Behold, your king!" 
How does that prove that Jesus is the archangel? How does that prove his point? Can someone help me? What am I not seeing? What am I not seeing? Focus, Alexander. If the Bible says, if Paul says, the Lord comes with his powerful angels, he will send his angels, and they have a trumpet, why would I assume that when the Lord descends, the voice of the archangel means his voice? Why wouldn't I assume that as kings would often do, appear with an entourage, and the entourage would then blow the trumpet and announce, behold your king, that the king of kings, the Lord of lords, would ascend with his entourage, and that one of his archangels would announce, cry out, behold your king. Behold your king. Why would I assume that this means the voice of the archangel is Jesus' voice because he's the archangel? The same arguments that Greg Stafford used, Doug Batchelor just used, but to prove the opposite point. Isn't it ironic, Ingrid, and everyone else? Are you catching the irony? Stafford uses these passages to prove that Christ is the first creature of God a created archangel named Michael. Doug Batchelor uses these passages to prove Michael is not a creature. Michael is the name of Christ, and Christ is not created. He's the creator of all things. He's God Almighty. Two groups using the same passages to prove opposite points. Isn't it ironic? Now, everyone got it? Now, let me leave you with the last clip. Let me now shock you. Both the Joe's Witnesses and the Adventists are aware the Reformers, like John Calvin, Jonathan Edwards, John Gill, and even Protestant expositors, all believe Michael was the name of Jesus Christ. Now, watch this clip. Now, guys, are you tired? Can I go another hour, Lord willing, and talk about Shake catch up, boy, or should I wrap it up? But first, let's play this clip and then we'll take a vote. Now, final clip from this guy. The final clip. This comes at the 47 minute, 47 second mark. Watch who he's going to quote. And then I'm going to quote them too. Here I'm going to quote James White, John Calvin, and show you. He's not lying. He's not lying. This is the heritage of the Reformation Protestants. These are your spiritual forebears. This is the fruit of the Reformation, chaos and confusion. 47 minute, 47 second mark. Watch. Start a little earlier. Listen. Look who he's going to quote. To be acquainted with that voice now. Now, you can run into people. They're going to say, you believe that Michael is Jesus. You know, I had a wise evangelist tell me one time. He says, don't say that too early. You hear it? Don't say that too early. A seven-day Adventist evangelist teaching him, Doug, don't say that too early in your evangelism. Don't come out and tell people that we seven-day Adventists think Christ is the Archangel Michael, even though we don't think Michael is created. Don't say that. First tell them things that they agree with, with us. Then when they believe, then teach them the whole spiel. Don't mention Ellen G. White. They don't need to know about her. Get them to believe this is the true church. Then indoctrinate them with Ellen G. White. Did you catch it? One more time. Let me rewind it. Here, guys, please. Listen again. I want to hear that voice. You know, if you want to recognize that voice, then it'd be good for you to be acquainted with that voice now. Now, you're going to run into people. They're going to say... You believe that Michael is Jesus? You know, I had a wise evangelist tell me one time, he says, don't say that too early in an evangelistic meeting because it wigs people out. See? They think that you are saying that Jesus is a created being, that he's not almighty, eternal God, because that's what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. Isn't it ironic? He just mentioned Jehovah's Witnesses? See, Doug, if you tell them Jesus Michael, they, they're, they're going to think you believe 
that Jesus Christ is created and not Almighty God. That's what Joe's witnesses believe. Isn't it ironic? That <laughs> his, oh my goodness. He is mentioning Joe's witnesses who think that Christ is the Archangel Michael and therefore a creature. And they're wrong. He is the Archangel Michael, but he's uncreated because Jesus is uncreated. He's God Almighty, creator of all things. And yet he's still Michael. So Michael's not a creature. They think that Jesus is created and that Jesus is Michael. But it is true that Michael, who is as God, is Jesus. He's not created. And, and he's eternal God. If you He's not created. He's eternal. So again, he's clear twice. Christ is not created. He's uncreated. He's God Almighty, eternal God, the creator of all things. And therefore, Michael's not a creature. Think that this is something that Pastor Doug got on his own. I need to now confess I didn't. This is what the great Protestant reformers all believe. Did you hear it? Their Catholic brothers and sisters were worshiping Michael. This is what all the Protestant reformers believe. The Protestant reformers all believed. I'm going to play that two more times. They all believe Protestant reformers and their Catholic brothers and sisters were worshiping Michael. See again the slander? No, Catholics were not worshiping Michael. They venerated Michael because veneration is not worship given to God. So there's a slander again because the Pope is the Antichrist. The Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon, according to them. Ellen G. White. Right? Right? And the Protestant reformers, their brothers and sisters, inherited the notion that Michael, if he's worshipped, then must be Jesus Christ. Do you understand? I, I don't think you understand what he's saying here. He is disassociating Adventists from the reformers. Did you catch it? Number one, listen to what they believe carefully. They do not think that seven-day Adventism is a denomination of the Reformation. They disown and deny the reformers like they do the Catholic Church. They think Adventism is the true church established by Christ to restore the true gospel. Can you guys hear me? Because my screen is not showing up. Can you hear the audio? Forget my screen. Can you at least hear the audio? Let me know if you can hear the audio because my screen has gone kaputs. All right, let me know. I can't hear you guys. Yeah, because I can't see myself on screen. My screen's gone kaputs. All right. So you understand? Seven-day Adventists do not think they are a Protestant Reformation denomination. They think they're the true church established by Christ when he restored the church because the church was lost. This is why he can talk about the Protestant Reformers and their Catholic brothers and sisters, because the Catholics are not the brothers and sisters of the Adventists. They're the brothers and sisters of the Reformers. You got it? You see what he's saying? You guys got it? Let me know, because I want to hear now see who he's going to quote. Put a one, guys. Give me feedback. Let me know. Catching it? Yeah, Lydia, that's what they believe. Because in the 19th century, Lydia, they called themselves restorationists because they believed that after the death of the last apostle, John, from the second century, the church of Jesus Christ was corrupt. Corrupt. Okay? Lost. So in the 19th century, the Lord waited about 17 to 1800 years to then raise up people to restore the church that had been lost. So they think the Adventists were raised up by Christ to restore the true church, and Ellen G. White was a messenger receiving revelations from Christ regarding the correct interpretation of Scripture. So they don't consider themselves Protestant. They consider themselves the true church. They're not Protestants. They're not Catholics. The reformers were no better. They got closer to the truth than the Catholics, but they still, at the end of the day, these churches are corrupt and apostate. It's only the Adventists that are the true church, true Christians. This is what they teach. Are you guys catching it? Put it on so I can now finish the last clip. And then I'm going to show you what the reformers thought. 
Okay, let's go back a little bit more. Lest you think we made it up. The Protestant reformers all believe Christ was Michael. Here, one more time. Listen. Jesus, you know, I had a wise evangelist tell me one time, he says, don't say that too early in an evangelistic meeting because it wakes people out. They think that you are saying that Jesus is a created being, that he's not almighty, eternal God, because that's what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. They think that Jesus is created and that Jesus is Michael. Randy. It is true that Michael, who is as God, is Jesus. But he who gives a damn that it's buffering, Randy? Can you hear my voice, Randy? I don't care if it's buffering, Randy. As long as you can hear my voice. All right, let's continue. Read it, and, and he's the eternal God. If you think that this is something the pastor done God on his own, I need to now confess I didn't. This is what the great Protestant reformers all believe. Listen. When their Catholic brothers and sisters were worshiping Michael as Saint Michael, an angel, they studied the Bible and said, no, that's not the case. Michael is one of the pre-incarnation names of Jesus. He's often the angel of the Lord that appeared to the patriarchs. You hear? Jesus has been involved in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. In the Bible, when it says, in the beginning, what? God. He's from cover to cover in the Bible. And so typically this Old Testament Christophanies, it says Michael. Listen to what some of the uh, Protestant theologians have said. He's not going to quote the Protestant theologians. Protestant reformers all believe Christ was Michael. Now he's going to quote Protestant theologians. Listen. Adam Clark. Adam Clark. He's like John Wesley's right-hand man. Of the Adam Clark commentary of the whole Bible spoke seven languages, including Greek and Hebrew. Did you hear it? Adam Clark, John Wesley's right hand man, the Wesleyan movement, the Methodist movement. Adam Clark, who wrote a massive Bible commentary, it's online for free, who knew several languages. What does Adam Clark say? A Protestant, Trinitarian. Jesus is Michael. Listen. Michael, he is like God, sometimes appears to signify Messiah. Well, he's a little vague. He says sometimes. Listen to what um, Matthew Henry says. Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry, man, what a commentator. Man, what a commentator. Adam Clark, John Wesley's right-hand man, a Protestant Trinitarian Bible expositor. His commentary is online for free. You can read it. Michael, a name for Jesus Christ. Matthew Henry, Henry's commentary in the Bible, one of the most famous Protestant Bible commentaries. What does he say? about Michael and the Lord Jesus. He's going to quote him. It's all online. He's not lying. Michael and his angels on one side and the dragon and his angels on the other. Christ, the great angel of the covenant and his faithful followers, Satan and all his instruments. Do you hear that? Matthew Henry says in Revelation 12, 7, Michael and angels, that's Christ. That's the name for Christ. Look at John Gill, Baptist theologian, wrote the Baptist commentary. John Gill. Michael called in the New Testament the archangel, the prince of angels, the head of all principalities and powers, is none other than Christ, the son of God. John Gill, and he's right. I quoted Gill in one of my articles. John Gill, Reformed Baptist Calvinist, wrote a massive content in the Bible online for free. Trinitarian, believe Jesus is God Almighty, the Son, not a creature. Says in his commentary in Jude and other passages, Michael is none other than the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, friends, this is what the Protestants used to all believe as preachers. They're not reading their Bibles anymore. He's Christ, the Son of God, the first of the chief princes, superior to the angels in nature and name and office. He came to help Gabriel, not as a fellow creature, but as a Lord of hosts. Wow. Not as a fellow soldier, but as a general of the armies in heaven and earth and superior to him in wisdom and in strength. And he helped him by giving him fresh counsels and orders and instructions, which he following succeeded, which in following he succeeded. You read what Charles Spurgeon said. Charles Spurgeon. The Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, brethren. Lord Jesus, bless the numbers for your glory, not for my praise. And let us be content for your glory, Father, Son, and Spirit. The Prince of Preachers, the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon.
Reformed Calvinist. What does he say about Michael? Watch here. It's called the Prince of Preachers. All Protestants and Baptists love to quote Spurgeon. Yep. This cannot be misunderstood. We read that Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, his angels, and the dragon was cast down. The fight is going on every day. Michael is the Lord Jesus. Do you hear that? Charles Spurgeon, commentary on Revelation 12. Michael is the Lord Jesus. Only archangel. There's only one archangel. It's, it, it means a leader or chief of the angels. That's Christ. Michael, you see, is involved in the liberation, resurrection, and sanctification of his people. There you go. That's it. There you go. What I'll do is I'm going to end with a few more clips. And Lord willing, I'll do something tonight. I'll retitle this. I will retitle this. Doug Batchelor, Seventh-day Adventist, is Jesus the Archangel Michael. I'm going to make a few final points. And then I'll do a late stream tonight, Lord willing. Lord willing, Lord Jesus willing, I will come later tonight, late night. For some of you in Europe, it's going to be early morning or afternoon in Australia. And I'll do a response to Sheik Ketcha Boy. Sheik Ketcha Boy. Because I think we already did a very thorough <clears throat> session. So I'll do one later tonight, God willing. But let me give you a few more quotes. And then, Lord willing... I'm going to show you how Jude 9 buries this argument. Are you listening? Pay attention, brethren. James White, the first edition of his book, Forgotten Trinity, updated edition. James White, in this edition, page 212. Let me see. Is it 212? Okay, watch here. I got to underline. So page 213, my fault. Lord, save me from error. Correct me on the spot. Page 213, right here, I have it underlined, right? Page 213, end note 18, number 18, to chapter 7. Chapter 7, end note 18, on page 213 of this edition. It's page 212 of this edition. Watch what he says. Page 212 of this edition. Okay. It's Endnote 18, number 18, page 212. What does James White admit? Don't go anywhere, guys. I'm not done yet because I'm going to quote John Calvin. I quote from the first edition, page 213. Endnote 18. I refer again to the belief of Joe's witnesses that Jesus Christ Prior to the incarnation was Michael the Archangel, a created being. Now, underline, so you know I'm not lying. See? He admits, but conveniently doesn't mention John Calvin's name. Why not? Jimmy Muhammad White? Some Christian theologians have identified Christ with Michael, but in the process have insisted that Christ is eternal and uncreated, meaning that his appearance as Michael would not apply creatureliness or limitedness. I do not accept such an identification in light of the discussion of Michael in Jude 9. Did you hear it? He admits. Some Christian theologians, right? Some Christian theologians who are Trinitarians, who believe Christ the person's uncreated, almighty, was Michael, but I reject it. Why didn't he tell you who these theologians were? Now, let me show you from John Calvin's mouth or pen because he's dead now. Go to this link. I want you to go to this link. Here it is online. John Calvin's commentary on Daniel 12. And I'm going to post it in the screen. Calvin's commentaries, volume 25, Daniel, part two. Here's the link. It's online. I found it. John Calvin. What did he say about Michael? John Calvin, quote, there it is right there, so you can see it. Let me show it to you. We're almost done because i got to end it with June 9. I can't go anywhere without discussing June 9 and how it buries them. And Lord willing, I'll do another session on Shake Ketchup Boy. This was too important for me 
to rush through. Here it is. Right here. Chapter 12, so you don't think I'm making it up. Click on it, save it, read it. Who is Michael, Calvin? John Calvin, who is Michael? Look what he says. And I quote, you ready? From the post. Here you go. You ready? Let's go here. Quote, Daniel 12.1, look what he says. John Calvin, who's Michael? Here you go. Watch here. Quote, by Michael, many agree in understanding Christ as the head of the church. Did you catch it? John Calvin, Daniel 12.1. He says, there are many who think that Michael is Christ. But if it seems better to understand Michael as the archangel, <clears throat> this sense will prove suitable. For under Christ as the head, angels are the guardians of the church. So if you want to think Michael is an angel created, then Christ is his head and assign Michael to protect the church. Now watch what he says, though. <clears throat> Whichever be the true meaning, God was the preserver of his church by the hand of his only begotten son. And because the angels are under the government of Christ, he might entrust this duty to Michael. All right. But what does he believe? Let's go on a little further. What do you believe? Here you go. Here you go, guys. What does he believe? John Calvin, what do you believe? Quote, same commentary. Here you go. Daniel, therefore, represented Michael as the guardian of the church, and God had enjoined this duty upon Christ. As we learn from the 10th chapter of John. So Christ is the one who preserves the church. John 10, 28, 29. Now watch. As we stated yesterday, Michael may mean an angel. Watch. Quote John Calvin. But I embrace, I, John Calvin, embrace the opinion of those who refer this to the person of Christ. I, John Calvin, believe Michael is Jesus. Because it suits the subject best to represent him as standing forward for the defense of his elect people. I, John Calvin, take the view that others do. Michael is Jesus Christ. Sink in. Michael is Jesus Christ. I, John Calvin, this is what I believe. You got it? Now let's end it with Jude, which he butchered. Jude destroys the claim that Jesus is the Archangel Michael. I'm going to give you my article on it, right? You need to study this, and I may have to do another session on it. Michael's contention with Satan. Michael's contention with Satan. Here's my article. You guys there, or did I lose you guys? We're almost done. I may have to do another session on this. This passage in Jude shows Michael cannot be cannot be the Archangel Michael. And I may have to do a session on it. Let me know if you guys are still there. Let me show you the link. Here it is. So you can see it, then we're going to wrap it up. Those who say Michael is Jesus, yet believe in the Trinity, insult the Lord. Those who say, this is my article, there's the link, Michael is the Lord Jesus, but believe in the Trinity, insult the Lord. You know why? Let me tell you why. Marcy Lynn, everyone, we're going to wrap it up. And Lord willing, pray for me, Marcy. I'm going to do a late night session. Hopefully you'll be awake for it, if the Lord wills, if God wills. Let me show you why. Let's see what the passage is saying. And it's all in my post, quoting authorities and lexicons to show you Michael cannot be the Lord Jesus Christ because of what it said. Jude 1, 8 to 9. Read with me. New Revised Standard Version. Yet in the same way, these dreamers also defile the flesh, reject authority, and slander the glorious one. So it's saying mm -hmm. these perverts, these false Christians, these heretics who use the grace of Christ to engage in immorality have no fear and no shame that they even dare to slander glorious beings, celestial beings, angelic creatures, not being afraid, that these angelic creatures can harm them because they're more powerful than them. Now watch what he says. But when the archangel Michael contended with the devil and disputed about the body of Moses, he did not dare. How dare you say this is Jesus Christ? He did not dare 
to bring a condemnation slander against them, but said, the Lord rebuke you. You understand what he's saying here? That even Michael, as powerful and glorious as he was, did not dare accuse Satan because he knew Satan was a worthwhile foe. So Michael had to invoke the authority of Christ, a God, of God, which would be Christ, to go up against Satan because he knew better to try to slander, accuse, and condemn Satan by his own authority. He knew he needed the backing of God, authorized by God, the power of God, to oppose Satan. And you're telling me this is Christ? Which person in his rightful mind, sane mind, would say, Christ would not dare, would even think about condemning or slandering Satan because he knew Satan is a worthy foe, so he had to come against him and the authority of his father. You are blaspheming Jesus to even insinuate this is Christ. You understand the point? The point here is these perverts, these heretics, these immoral swine who use the grace of Christ to justify immorality and teach perverted doctrines, who then think that they have the authority to slander heavenly beings, not realizing they're playing with fire, should learn a lesson from Michael. Even Michael, as great as he is, as majestic as he is, has enough respect for Satan and his authority that he would not dare come up against Satan without having the authority of God backing him up and would not dare accuse or slander or condemn Satan because he knows he's a worthy foe and he can only conquer him by the power of God. And you're telling me this is Jesus? Jesus would not dare come up against Satan and condemn Satan and slander Satan in the sense, well, it wouldn't be slander because whatever Jesus says is true, Unless he invoked the authority of the Lord? Did you catch it? You would dare say this is Jesus who would not dare, who would not have the audacity to go against Satan? Are you kidding me? Jesus is almighty God. He created Satan. Satan's under his feet. And he can wipe it out, wipe them out in a nanosecond. What are you talking about? This passage destroys the lie of Adventism and Joe's witnesses that Christ is the Archangel Michael. Are you with me there? I will do a session on this, Lord willing. But did you learn how this passage proves Michael cannot be the Lord Jesus Christ if you're a Trinitarian? If you are a Trinitarian, and you believe Jesus is almighty God, how in the hell would you think Christ is Michael when Jude 1.9 is telling you even Michael, as glorious as he is, knew better than to go against Satan without having the authority and backing of God because he knew Satan is a worthy opponent who is very powerful and you cannot mess with him. How can you talk about Jesus this way? Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses can because they don't think Jesus is almighty God. A Jehovah's Witness can say that because he thinks Jesus is a creature. But if you're a Trinitarian, how would you even have the audacity to connect this with the Lord Jesus Christ? You see the problem? So folks, Lord willing, I hope this blessed you. We had a good crowd. We had close to 600. May the numbers increase for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, not for my praise. May the Lord give me contentment. Now, if you were blessed, re-watch these sessions until you learn the arguments and they become second nature, nature. Upload them, clip them, translate them. Take my articles, study them until you understand them and share them. Use them on TikTok, Discord, Clubhouse, Pal Talk. Use these arguments in battle. Teach them to your family members, to your churches, to your neighbors. Inoculate them to know the truth of Scripture. And pray for one another and pray for me that we walk worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we obey the word and not be hypocrites. Ask the Lord to never allow me to shame him and fall into any sin, but glorify the Lord Jesus Christ by obedience and holiness. 
Cry out to the Lord for me to bring my daughters now, not later. I want to see that miracle. It's too long. May the Lord give me strength to endure. I raise them in love of the Lord. The Lord save them from this adulterous, wicked, filthy union between Michelle and Martin. May the Lord rebuke them and protect my daughters. Ask the Lord to give my daughters and I perfect health, safety, security, right, protection, and that I see them grow up to be in love with the Lord if the Lord tarries and that they will fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and pray for provision. My support increase and stay steady and use that PayPal patron to do the ministry, to do the research, to do sessions, to write articles, provide for my daughters and myself and for those whom the Lord wants me to provide for the glory of the Father, glory of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, glory of the Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Son of God. We love you, Holy Spirit. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will return physically and bodily because you are alive. You are real. And we love you, Lord Jesus. We trust in you. Seal us by your spirit. Seal my daughters by your spirit. Seal our loved ones by your spirit to love you, Lord Jesus, until you summon us, until you return. And we pray you return sooner than later and save us. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Lord willing, I'll see you later. Pray that my throat is strong and healthy enough. I'll do a response to shake Porky Pig a little later tonight. Look for it if the Lord wills. Christ is risen, risen indeed. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. And I love you for the sake of the Lord and Theotokos, Holy Mother, beautiful Queen Mother. Pray for us and pray the Lord brings my daughters to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Take care.